I'm going to ask you to stand out of respect and reverence for the reading of God's holy infallible word. We're in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to read a couple verses of scripture. We're going to put our Bibles down. We're going to sit down, and I'm going to move my way through two chapters at a very brief pace. All right? So stay with me here. Beginning in the gospel of Luke, beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, the scripture reads, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those from the beginning or from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. I'm gonna, I was going to read this article to you, but it's, it's two pages long. And basically what it's saying is the virgin birth it was questioned uh, and rejected and historically and, and just they go into all this foolishness. And here's what I want to submit to you, folks. You need to come to a, to a determination today. If not today, really soon, whether the word of God is indeed the word of God or it isn't. Make up your mind. And if it is, then we need to adhere to what the word of God teaches. And if it isn't, you should probably not waste your time coming to church. People say, I can't believe you said that, Pastor. Well, I did. I have an amplified Bible here. If you don't have one of these, you should get one. Because the Amplified Bible does a really good job of amplifying things. Imagine that. <laughs> Let me read the, the verses I just read to you in the Amplified Version. This is what it says. Since, you have it up there? As is well known, many have undertaken to put in order and draw up a thorough narrative of the surely established deeds which have been accomplished and fulfilled in and among us. He says, many have undertaken this task to, come to, to accomplish an, uh, and establish the deeds that were surely established, he says, among us. They were fulfilled. Verse 2. He says, exactly as they were handed down to us by those whom from the beginning, the official beginning of Jesus' ministry, were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. That is, of the doctrines concerning the attainment through Christ of salvation in the kingdom of God. Now, for some of you, you're like, I don't know what that means. Salvation and kingdom of God and all that stuff may be confusing to you. But here's what we know. The gospel of Luke was recorded by a man named Luke. Luke was a Gentile. That means he was not Greek. He was, I'm sorry, he was not Jewish. Because he was not Jewish, he was, people who were not Jew, people who were Jewish listened to Jews. So you say, oh, all those Jews are all brainwashed. That's why they believed the Jesus story. Well, Luke was not. Luke was a Gentile. Well, he was stupid. Well, he was educated. He was, a, he was a doctor. So he's hardly stupid. Well, he believes in foolishness. I doubt it. Most doctors want some type of proof. Doctors are very scientific, if you will. Doctors don't believe it just because you say it. So I come in, I'm overweight, and my blood, blood, my blood pressure is high, and I tell the doctor, I'm eating right, and I'm exercising. And he's looking at me like, sure you are. <laughs> you know, doctors want proof. They don't, they don't just buy, up, buy sign off because you say so. But the Gospel of Luke was recorded 60 in, in, about, in about 60 A.D., 30 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Just 30 years. You say, well, that's a long time, Pastor. Yeah, if you're 10 <laughs> or if you're 20, that's a long time ago. I'm 42. I remember being 12. I do. I remember a lot of things. I remember the space shuttle blowing up. I remember a lot of things. I remember Jimmy Carter, the, the peanut man. I didn't even know him that well. I knew Ronald Reagan when he got elected. I understood all those things at that young age. It's a lot of stuff I remember from 30 years ago. And I'm sure you do too if you've been around for any length of time. 30 years is not a long time. The Gospel of Luke was recorded by Luke 30 years. So there's, there's plenty of people who are still alive and well who were telling him what he needed to hear. He was a doctor, so he had instant credibility. People gave credence to what he said. He was a Gentile. He was not Jewish. So people say, oh, the Jews are all believing that hocus pocus and they're just brainwashed. Well, Luke didn't. So it took a lot to convince him. Now check this out. Here's what he says. He says many, in verse 1, he says many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Things have happened among us. And people are talking about it. There's a man in history, if you go back, his, his name was Marcion. R-M-A-R-C-I-O-N. This guy began to write doctrine. He began to record things that were not biblical. What do we call that? Heresy. He be, it comes from the word hearsay. That's where we get our word hearsay from. He started coming up with some crazy stuff. It's crazy. And the apostles, and there was what we call apostolic succession, they're passing down the teachings orally. 
to the next one. So the Apostle Paul taught Timothy. And Timothy who taught the church Ephesus and so on and so forth. It's passed down apostolically, apostolic succession. Well, Marcion slips into the mix somehow and starts teaching heresy. That's when they said, hey, hey, man, we need to kind of put something down to preserve what's really happened so that people like Marcion a thousand years from now or a hundred years from now or ten years from now doesn't come in and mess everything up. <laughs> Thus the Bible was recorded. And it wasn't recorded like you think. It happened over a long period of time. But they began to start to document what was happening. And they took great effort into doing that. They put a lot of effort into that. And Luke said, hey, a lot of people are doing this. I took it upon myself to do it too. That's what he's saying. He says, from those, listen to this. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that are happening. These unbelievable things. These supernatural things that nobody's going to believe a hundred years from now because they certainly don't believe them now. He says, just as they were handed down to us by those who were first eyewitnesses. You know what an eyewitness is? Man, Channel 7 used to, eyewitness news. And they'd come out on the scene, hey, we have a car accident, 10 car, pri- ten car pile up, who's seen it? Tell us what happened. Eyewitness news, they showed up on the scene, tell me what happened. Boom, microphone in your face. They always pick the most ignorant person to talk to. <laughs> but there's eyewitness account. And even the ignorant account of what happened was still an eyewitness, he saw it. Maybe he can't articulate what he saw well. But he's telling you what he saw. Who are you to refute what he saw? You didn't see it. And in that custom, what was established, what established truth was two witnesses. That's it. So he says, Luke says, listen, many have taken, account, taken the time to record what has happened. He says, from these eyewitness accounts, for those who were servants of the word, therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, from the beginning, it seemed good to me also to write an orderly account. Here's Luke, Gentile physician, living a life of ill repute, probably, doing what he wants, getting all he can, can all he gets and sitting on the can. He's having a good life. He's a doctor. He's probably living pretty well. And now he's going to leave all that and forsake all that for the sake of Christ. And he says, hey, I'm not going to do that for nothing. I need to check this out and make sure it's real. So he does his homework. He does an investigation, a very thorough one. And he says, I've done it. He says, so it seemed important to me, most excellent Theophilus. A lot of debates as to what that means. The word translates means lover of God. I believe he's talking to you, Christian. So that you may also know that certainty of the things that you have been taught. You can know with certainty. You know, all of us don't have the resources to jump on an airplane and go to Jerusalem and go stand in the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. I know a person who did. You know what he told me? He says, hey, Jose, you don't believe this. I said, it was empty? He said, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, imagine that. It was empty. You don't have to tell me that. I read my Bible and I believe it. So anyway, here's what Luke, he says, I've done an account of this. Now, switch over, I want you to, we're in chapter 1 still. I'm not going to go through all these verses. But in beginning in verse 5, he begins to do an incredible job. Luke does an incredible job. He says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. All of this is documented history. You don't believe it, you can go back and check. There was a time where there was a man named Herod who was king. And it's outside of the Bible that records this man existed and he had a time where he reigned. And there was also a priest. You could check the the books as far as the uh, history of uh, Israel goes. That Zechariah was a man. He he existed. And he was a descendant of of, uh, Elizabeth. His wife was a descendant of Aaron. Both men were upright in the sight of God. All of this stuff he's talking about is is, is, uh, proof that could be picked apart. At any time, you can find something where he's deviated or he's alive or he wasn't uh, totally accurate. You could pick it apart and say, well, yeah, don't believe the word of God because he was inaccurate here, but you can't do it. And so this is happening. And then in chapter 2, this is what it says. Look, Luke, in incredible accuracy again, he says, in the days of Caesar Augustus, an issue, a decree, a census that should be taken of the whole Roman Empire. This, look what he says in parentheses in verse 2. This was the first census, not the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth, but this is the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Did you know there was, a, this is apologetics for you. Somebody said, oh man, Quirinius never existed. They actually went out there to try to find if this guy really existed. This is hogwash, they say. Well, as they were looking to see if he existed, they found a coin with the guy's name on it. And, you know, sure enough, Luke was accurate, but they also discovered a whole lot of other stuff that they didn't intend to find. A lot of other things that supported uh, the gospel account. Everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph went up to the house of Nazareth in Galilee, in Judea, uh, in Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. 
Once again, this is proof. I mean, you go back and ask the Jews. You, the Jews, they had a very oral tradition. They knew what was going on. They said, yeah, I remember that census. I remember when the space shuttle blew up. I remember this stuff happening. It wasn't that long ago. And this is when it came to pass where they went in. This is incredible, folks. People say, well, Jesus manipulated some of the prophecies. He sat on a donkey, and he rode that donkey into Jerusalem because he knew it was prophetic. It was supposed to happen. Okay, I'll give you that one. But what about manipulating where he was born? Do you think he could manipulate that one if he wasn't supposed to be born in Bethlehem? He wasn't even from there. It was a census that took place. God used a supernatural. God used moved supernaturally through something that was naturally happening. Go to your own town, and the Messiah was born as it was prophesied in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem like the Bible said he would be. Imagine that. So this is what happens. Everyone went to his town to register. In verse 5, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him. You guys know the story. They're expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes, placed him in a manger, because there was no room in the inn. All of this can be verified and has been. So people say, well, if the Bible is accurate in history, you're just going to yank out the pieces you're just a little hard to swallow. But if you ask yourself once again, is anything impossible for Almighty God? The answer is no. Verse 8. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Shepherds. Keeping watch over their flock at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. A great joy that is for all people. That's you too, folks. It's great news. He says, to you, in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Christ, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you, he tells the shepherds. Go into town and find this baby. You're going to find him. He's going to be wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts, that's angels, appeared with the angel, praising God, saying glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Is what we sing all the time. He says, in earth and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. With, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing. You know what they, they didn't believe it. They just saw some angels appear, boop, in the darkness, freaked out. Oh, my goodness. Angel tells them what they can find. Boop, angels disappear, and they're like, man, we got to go check this out. Let's go verify it. As if the appearance of the angels wasn't enough, and I submit to you it wasn't. So they went to be eyewitnesses. So let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, they said, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger when they had seen him. They spread the word. They seen him just like the angels had said they would. They spread the word concerning what has been told about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering in her heart. When the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all things that they had seen and heard, which was just as they had been told which were just as it had been told. Not pretty close, not paraphrasing, not kind of active. It was just as they'd been told. There is witnesses after witnesses after witnesses to the virgin birth, the incarnate, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. What I find extremely interesting here is that Luke never mentions the Magi, the wise men. You saw that in the movie last night. Your nativity scene, folks, is not accurate. You think that the wise men made it to the manger? They did not. Okay, that's all right. That shouldn't shake your faith. Two different stories intertwined. We messed it up. The Bible didn't. The Bible's accurate. When those wise men showed up, Jesus was a toddler already. He's probably two years old, maybe. They went to a house, not a manger, where they found him. This should be verified through the scriptures. The wise men never showed up in Luke's account. You say, so, ah! There's a hole in the story. No, not necessarily. You know what I think? This is my personal opinion. I believe Luke was thoroughly convinced. He stopped. Jesus was two years old. He stopped at the incarnation of Christ. He stopped at the virgin birth in that scene, if you will. He didn't fast forward two years. Actually, the next time he starts talking, Jesus is an, is an adult, and he pops up later. There is tons and tons and tons of proof. I'm not here to convince you, folks. Anything I can talk you into, someone else can talk you out of. I'm here because I want you to know what you believe. If you're here and you don't know what you believe, you need to study to show thyself approved, the scripture says. Right. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yeah. Okay, and so my desire is today is this, that you understand and you know and understand 
that Jesus Christ is the reason for the season. He is the reason we celebrate this Christmas holiday. It is his birth. Somebody said, well, you weren't born on December 25th. So what? Pick a day. We can celebrate it July 18th for all I care. Who cares? The date's not important. I shared this a couple weeks ago where a friend of mine said, hey, God could have wrote on the moon, Jesus says. He could have used his finger and aligned the stars to say that, and the whole world would have believed. News flash. The whole world would not have believed. Jesus Christ comes into the world in miraculous form, a virgin birth, and leaves in miraculous form in a resurrected body, and then ascends into heaven. And people are like, oh. I don't know about you folks, but I believe it. And Jesus is the reason for the season. I'm going to leave you with this thought. Here's what I'm going to close with. Actually, two thoughts. One, we sing Christmas carols. What is a bough of holly, actually? Deck the halls with boughs of holly, or however you sing that song. And then fa ra 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 right? <laughs> you got that. All right. I'm not alone. So, I mean, what is this? Tis the season to be jolly. Fa la 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 la. Rudolph the red nosed reindeer. I have kids, so I'm like trying to be careful here. Had a very shiny nose. Nothing wrong with those songs. Dashing through the snow in a one horse open sleigh. Over the fields we go, laughing all the way. Those Christmas songs. So those are Christmas songs. Are they? Not the Christmas we know. My favorite hymn is Hark the Herald. It's in here somewhere. And it basically goes like this. I'm not going to sing it, I don't think. It says, Hark the Herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all you nations rise and join the triumph of the skies. With angelic host proclaims, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald, the angels sing in glory to the newborn king. Amen. Man, and every verse is powerful, profound. Yeah, somebody, there it is. Yank the next one up if you can. This is incredible. This is a Christmas carol, folks. Yes. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold, he come, offering of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased with, as men, with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us. Hark the herald angels sing in glory to the newborn king. Go to the next verse. People say, oh, how man, Jesus born, what's the big deal? It's a big deal, folks, it's a big deal. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings, mildly laid his glory by. You know what that means, folks? Jesus Christ could have come in glorious form and just smacked people around saying, you know what, you're crazy, you're out of line, and I'm going to judge you right here and now. Could have come down in all of his splendor and all of his glory as he rightfully deserved to do, but he didn't. Mild he laid his glory by. He was born so that men no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth and born to give us our second birth. Amen? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Born to give a second birth. Born again. Oh, born again Christians are crazy. Yeah, they should be. We're born again a second birth. Hark the herald angels singing glory to the newborn king.